As you watch this teaching, I would like to ask you to please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it. This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. My friends, this is Rick Renner, and today I'm at the Pushkin Museum of Fine Arts, downtown Moscow. We've been talking about prophetic ministry, but somebody always wants to know, but what about false prophets? Well, false prophets are real too, and we need to be able to discern who they are. And when I look at these two statues, I think about false prophets. These two statues are from the 13th century from Basel, Switzerland. This one represents the devil. And look how happy he looks. Standing next to him is a virgin that he's trying to seduce, and she does not realize it is the devil talking to her. But when you walk around and look on the back side of this statue, the entire back side reveals this is a creature from hell. It makes me think of what Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 15. He said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. What in the world did Jesus mean when he said false prophets come in sheep's clothing? And what do those words ravenous wolves really mean? It must be serious because Jesus said we need to be aware of false prophets. We need to be on guard against them. And this teaching is not intended to make you suspicious, but to give you discernment so you can recognize who is not a real prophet and who is, so you can receive the bona fide gift that God has given to the church and to you. But today, we're going to see what the Bible says about false prophets. But first, I want you to watch this. 30 years in the making, Rick Renner's new book, Apostles and Prophets, is being called Essential Teaching for Every Believer. And now, this book is available anywhere books are sold or online at renner.org. This beautifully bound 750-page book is the definitive study available on Apostles and Prophets. You'll learn how this essential teaching has been overlooked in the modern church and why it's important for every believer to understand the Bible's definition of these roles. This book lays a biblical, spiritual, intellectual, and historical foundation to the words apostle and prophet. Through its detailed information, Apostles and Prophets allows you to have correct apostolic vision for the church as it is laid out in the New Testament. Through beautiful illustration and detailed descriptions, you'll see what it was like in the early church and how early church leaders operated within these ministry gifts. Call now to get Apostles and Prophets for just $30 or go to renner.org. My friend, I want to ask you, have you ordered your copy of Apostles and Prophets? Today is the last day that we're offering it on the program, so please call or go online to order yours now. The subtitle says, Their Roles in the Past, in the Present, and in the Last Days. And according to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 13, these gifts are going to be functioning in the church to the end of the church age. And we need to know what the Bible says about apostles and prophets. And if you consider yourself to be a serious believer, you need to read this book and you ought to buy a second one because you're going to want to give it to your pastor. But we're also offering you the series by the same title. It's 15 parts, comes in multiple formats, apostles and prophets, their roles in the past, the present, and the Last Days Church. It's based on these programs, and I know you cannot remember everything you've heard, so you need to get the series so you can see it or hear it, and remember that it comes with a wonderful study guide. But today we're going to be talking about false prophets. What about false prophets? Well, we've already seen that there were false apostles, but there were also false prophets during the time of the Old Testament, the New Testament, and there are still false prophets today. But if the prophetic gift is real, it is certain that the devil will try to falsify the prophetic gift. And just like there were real prophets, there are also false prophets. But the truth is, anything can be 
counterfeited. For example, when you read the Bible, you find there are false apostles. There are false prophets. There really can be false evangelists. There can be false pastors. There can be false teachers. Anything can be falsified, including money. Sometimes money is counterfeit. You say, ah, I don't want to have any counterfeit money. Okay, what's your response to that? Do you stop using money because you're afraid that you might end up with a counterfeit bill? Of course not. That would be a silly response. Anything can be counterfeited, including money. But friends, you have to have money to live with. And in the same way, if God has given prophets to the church, we need prophetic ministry. And just to reject prophetic ministry because of a few bad experiences would be a grave mistake. We need to learn how to recognize legitimate prophets and how to recognize false prophets. But again, anything can be falsified. For example, we read in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty six. In Galatians 2, 4, that there can be false brothers. We read in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13, that there can be false apostles. We read in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, there can be false teachers. And we read in Matthew 7, 15, and Matthew 24, 11, and Revelation 16, 13, and Revelation 19, 20, that there can be false prophets. But this word false carries the idea of anything that is false deceptive or untruthful. It's compounded with the word prophetes, the word prophet. So it really pictures somebody that is bogus or a bogus prophet. It used, it's used primarily in the Bible to describe outright false prophets, but it really might describe a genuine prophet who's become corrupted over a period of time and has become a false representation of the Christ-given prophetic gift. But Jesus himself warned of false prophets in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, and his words are very important. And remember that Jesus was a prophet. He was a prophet. And as a prophet, now he's describing false prophets. And in Matthew 7, 15, Jesus said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. But notice he says, they will come to you in sheep's clothing, which pictures a disguise, and this shows intent. It means this group knowingly operates in a disguise and projects themselves to be sincere when they are not. But in this verse, Jesus also importantly likens them to wolves. Wolves, the Greek word lukas, and this Greek word lukas, which here is translated as the word wolves, depicts a wolf or a jackal, and depict, depicted wolfish individuals who come to attack, victimize, and take advantage of others. Now, we could stop right there, and that's already pretty bad, but there's something else that's very strongly implied in this word wolf. The word wolf, at the very time that Jesus used it, the word lukos, was a slang word, and everybody knew that. It was a slang word used to depict, are you ready for this? Prostitutes, prostitutes. They are ravenous prostitutes. You really could translate it like that. This word wolf was a slang word that was used to depict prostitutes who wandered the streets at night howling to lure men into their dens of immorality. And once they lured them into their den or into their environment, they seduced them. And once they were seduced, they then robbed them. They howled as they walked through the streets trying to get attention as they advertised their services and their wares. And now Jesus uses this word wolves very importantly to say that just as prostitutes prowled the streets at night in order to sell themselves and their sexual services for money, Jesus clearly says that false prophets prowl through the church looking for people to take advantage of. That's a pretty insightful view of that word wolf. Like the prostitutes, false prophets prostitute their services as they give a so-called prophetic utterance for financial gain. By using the word wolves, which depicts these prostitutes, 
Jesus clearly taught that false prophets are those who spiritually prostitute themselves for some type of advantage or financial gain. Some of them began as false prophets, but some of them were real, authentic prophets who started out pure, but over a period of time, the lure of money or the lure of popularity began to affect them, and they begin to veer off course as they begin to prostitute their gift. And rather than be pure vessels who speak on behalf of God, they then began to use their spiritual giftings for self-gain or promotion. And due to a hidden agenda or some ulterior motive, their prophetic gift has become prostituted and hence false. Now, is that a new insight to that verse? Matthew 7, verse 15, when Jesus likens false prophets to wolves, they are like people who have prostituted themselves and they have begun to prostitute their spiritual gifting. That's precisely what Jesus said, and he told us to be aware of them. But God also commands us to try the spirits. Sometimes people say, don't think about what I'm saying, just accept what I'm saying. Well, my friends, there's never anything wrong with using your brain. And when we come to 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, we are commanded to try the spirits, and particularly those who say that they are prophets. This shouldn't surprise us. We saw already in Revelation chapter 2 that the church of Ephesus tried those who said they were apostles. They put them through a rigorous trial to determine whether they were or they were not. And now, when we come to 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, the Bible says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they be of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So in this verse, the word spirits and false prophets are synonymous. We're to try the spirits or we are to try the false prophets. Well, what does the word try mean? The word try is a translation of a form of the Greek word dokimazo. Ay, 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 this is a very strong word. It depicts a test intended to prove the quality and trustworthiness of a product. It denoted an intense examination of individuals, are you ready for this, who are running for a public office to determine whether or not they had the right kind of character that was needed for a person who stood in a public position. You couldn't just run for public office. First, you were put through a rigorous trial where they tested you to see whether or not you had the strength of character for that kind of position. And only after you had passed a character test could you be allowed to run for public office. But this word dokimazo was also used in Greek literature and in Roman times to test coins to see whether they were real or whether they were false, particularly after the time of Nero, after the great fire of Rome, Nero needed a lot of money to rebuild the center of Rome, and he didn't have enough money, so he made counterfeit coins. Only a tiny, tiny slither of the coin was actually made of silver, and the rest of it was covered with bogus materials. But if you just looked at the coin, it looked like a real silver coin. Just by looking at it, you couldn't tell the difference. And because so many fake coins were in circulation starting with the time of Nero, a test was de developed to determine whether coins were authentic or whether they were fake. Coins were examined. They were expected with a series of tests to determine if they were real or bogus. And once a batch of coins was proven to be genuine, they were bagged and tagged to declare they had passed inspection and were genuine. All of that is in this word try, which we now find in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. So now, like people running for public office in the ancient world needed to have impeccable character, 1 John chapter 4, by using the word try, the Greek word dokimazo tells us that we need to be sure that those who stand before us in prophetic ministry have proven character. Secondly, like the coins that were tested to see if they were legitimate or bogus, we need to know that those who stand before us in prophetic ministry are legitimate prophets. All of that is in this instruction, which we now find in 1 John 
chapter 4, verse 1. But there's something else I want you to understand. There is a great, great difference between wrong prophetic ministry and false prophetic ministry. They are not the same thing. You say, well, Rick, what do you mean? I'm going to tell you what I mean. And I want to begin with this scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, where the Apostle Paul himself writes and says that at this current moment, we see through a glass darkly. Well, if we see through a glass darkly, it means no one sees everything perfectly. And that means from time to time, even those that are authentic and very sincere will make a mistake. And personally, I cannot think of a single minister of the gospel who's not preached or taught something that he or she later regretted and possibly even retracted in my own ministry. I've had moments over the years when I've taught something with confidence and really believed that it was correct, but as I've gotten older and my understanding has increased, I've under, come to understand that what I taught earlier was incorrect. So in moments like that, I've had to correct some of the things that I taught in my earlier teaching seasons. That happens to everyone. Everyone makes mistakes and their knowledge grows as they get older. At that earlier time, I was doing my very best. But as time passed and I grew in knowledge and I grew in understanding, I found myself to be sincerely wrong on some earlier points. So in those moments, I've apologized and I've retaught what I had incorrectly taught earlier in my life to bring correction to it and to make sure others had heard what is correct. Now, I know of no minister of the gospel who hasn't had to do this at some point in his ministry. It's simply a fact that our understanding grows over time and that currently we see through a glass darkly. And that means there will be moments even when bona fide real prophetic ministry makes a sincere but wrong prophetic statement. They might do it because they spoke out of their own emotion. They may do it because they spoke out of their own soul. Or it may be that they had a correct word from the Lord, but they didn't stop with the word from the Lord. They went on and added their own commentary to it. There are all reasons that wrong prophetic ministry takes place. But just making a mistake does not mean that it's always false. And remember, everyone can make a mistake. But a sincere mistake does not mean that a person is false. And I want to say again, many authentic five-fold prophets have made prophetic mistakes and later brought correction to themselves or to what they said. But here's what's important. Much of this kind of error that I'm describing is avoidable if a five-fold prophet is in relationship with other five-fold gifts who have authority to speak into his or her life. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 6, For by wise counsel thou shalt make war, and in a multitude of counselors there is safety. And it's just the fact that when you're a five-fold ministry gift, you need to be in relationship with other five-fold ministry gifts who have authority to speak into your life. But a danger exists when any five-fold ministry gift becomes a free floater with no relationships who have authority to speak into his or her life. Now, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, verse 20, and Revelation 2, verse 1, Jesus likens his messengers to stars. And there are reasons why he does this. Stars give light in darkness, and we are called to do that. But what is very interesting is that stars have a predetermined orbit, and they veer from it very, very little over thousands and thousands of years. And in the same way that physical stars have a predetermined orbit, God wants His stars, His messengers, to be in orbit with other five-fold ministry gifts that He has a relationship with. And when you come to the book of Jude, verse 13, Jude talks about wandering stars. Wandering stars which were unaccountable, free-floating ministers who may have started out authentically, but somewhere along the way, they strayed off track. They got out of sync in their accountability to other five-fold ministry gifts that God had appointed them to orbit with in life. And because they veered off track, they begin to make very serious 
mistakes. But all of this is avoidable if we'll stay in relationship with those people that God has placed in our life. And when a fivefold ministry gift, including a prophet, stays in orbit with other authoritative voices who have the ability to speak into his or her life, it means several things. First, it means they're submitted to authority and better enabled to stand humbly and soberly in a more authoritative role. Next, they're not free floaters without accountability, but are established in a community of fellow ministers who can speak into their lives and ensure that what they're giving out has been tested and can stand up under scrutiny of those with whom they are in spiritual relationship. Next, it means their submission provides protection both for them and for those who follow them. It protects the prophet because he knows that if he does anything wrong, those with authority will bring it to his attention. Simply knowing that correction is possible is a str- correction is possible is a strong incentive to stay on track and to weigh one's words before saying, "Thus saith the Lord." And last, knowing that a prophet is in submission to others also means the church at large can rest at peace, knowing that the prophet who is speaking to them is under authority with seasoned voices who are speaking into his or her life. Wow, all of that belongs to any minister of the gospel who stays in orbit with accountable relationships that God designed for him or her to have. But when you come to Ephesians, Chapter 4, verses 12 to 13, the Apostle Paul writes, All fivefold ministry gifts, including the prophet, are given for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, which means the gift of prophet did not end at the end of the apostolic age. It is still with us. It will be with us to the end of the church age. And we need to be able to discern who is real and who is not. And when we recognize those that are genuine prophetic voices, we need to receive them, embrace them, and receive that measure of Christ into our lives and into the church. I'll be back in just a moment, and I want to pray for you. These days, a lot of people are being called apostles or prophets. But are real apostles and prophets still alive, well, and operating in the body of Christ today? In this much-needed, powerful series, Apostles and Prophets, Rick Renner covers what an apostle is and what an apostle is not. What are the signs of a true apostle? Why would anyone claim to be an apostle if he wasn't an apostle? What does the word prophet really mean? What do we know about how real prophets do and do not operate? What about false prophets? This 15-part series is available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $24. And right now, we urge you to get Rick's new book, Apostles and Prophets, their roles in the past, the present, and the last days, with over 700 pages of information to help fortify a solid foundation underneath your life for the special introductory price of $30. Joseph Z, founder of Z Ministries and best-selling author, says, Armed with his Bible, historical examples, and decades of tenured experience, Rick has produced a scholarly masterpiece that will right-size the mania, purge the dysfunction, confront willful ignorance, and cause celebration among the lovers of the Word of God. And Flashpoint host Gene Bailey says, this is not a stuffy manual on how to be an apostle or prophet. You will want to keep this book nearby the next time a question arises on the subject of apostles and prophets. Don't miss this exciting offer, the 15-part series, Apostles and Prophets, and the insightful and penetrating book, Apostles and Prophets. Call the number on your screen or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Hey friends, this is Rick Renner and today, I am standing in the foyer of Rick Renner Ministries in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I just wish I could pick you up and bring you here to see all the wonderful ministry that is happening in this facility where we receive thousands and thousands of phone calls from people just like you who reach out to us for prayer and for teaching they can trust. Proverbs 10, 21 says, the lips of the righteous feed many And we know that's our job. Our job is to feed many. And I want to say thank you to you for everything you've helped us do with your giving. You helped us construct our studio, purchase this building. And now in phase three of our ministry expansion program, we're wanting to pay this facility off so we can liberate all that money to take the teaching of the Bible around the world on additional channels and venues. 
And by being a part of our giving team, you can really help us make this happen. If you're not already a part of our giving team, please pray about joining us. And together we can join hands and through teaching of the Bible and by ministering to people that reach out to us and by sending teaching products around the world, we can really change people's lives. And it's amazing to me that today it's never been easier to make an impact in somebody else's life right from where you are. So thank you for praying about being a part of our giving team. And the moment you join, I want you to really expect the power of God to show up in your life. Be sure to let us know how to pray for you if you'll call us or send us an email. The moment we hear from you, we're going to really pray. And when I say we pray, I really mean we pray. We will fervently pray for God to move in your life. And today is the last day we're offering you my 15-part series called Apostles and Prophets, Their Roles in the Past, Present, and Last Days Church, which comes with a study guide. And today is the last day on the program, which we're offering you my book, called Apostles and Prophets. Look at it. It is really a substantial book. It's a book that you will refer to again and again and again. Really, it's a reference book just filled with information about the church, about ministry, about fivefold ministry, about the church age and what's going to happen at the end of the church age. There is so much in this book, and I want you to have it. And today is the last day we're offering it on the program. You can have all these things by going online, or by giving us a call. But I want to pray for you right now. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus. You have so much you want to impart to the church. We rebuke a spirit of fear. Lord, we don't worry about the fake. We just want to embrace what is real. We know you have so much real, wonderful things to impart to us, and we want to be able to knowledgeably embrace it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'll be back. Monday, it's going to be good. But until then, remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there's power. Hey friends, we're coming to an area near you and we want to invite you to come to one of our meetings. Sunday, February 5th, we're going to Church for All Nations in Colorado Springs and we will be with pastors Mark and Linda Cowart. Then on Sunday, February 12th, we're going to be at Legacy Church with Pastor Jeremy and Sarah Pearsons in Green Mountain Falls, Colorado. Then on Thursday, February 16th, Denise is having a women's meeting at the Stony Creek Hotel in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. On Saturday and Sunday, February 18th and 19th, we're going to be at the Living Word Christian Center with Pastor Mac Hammond in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. And on Sunday, February 26th, we're going to be at Faith Family Church with Pastors Michael and Vicki Bang in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. But please go to our website to affirm all these times and all these dates, and we look forward to seeing you there. This program was made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. If that teaching helped you, would you please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it.